the deep sea, it appears, actually holds the key to meeting the growing demand for electric vehicle batteries, not just for vehicles, though, for energy storage, for mobile phones, for laptops, for everything that lithium is needed in. But not just lithium. Manganese nodules found on the seabed contain vast amounts of metals such as manganese, which is needed for more energy-dense lithium batteries, nickel, and even cobalt. These are all essential for battery production. And it turns out that 4,000 meters below the sea actually lies the planet's largest source of battery metals. Hello, my friends. Welcome to the channel. I'm the Electric Viking. My name is Sam Evans. Great to see you. Thank you for tuning in. Mining always comes at a cost. However, mining this part of the sea could actually cause significantly less damage to the planet. And incredibly, there's actually enough metals in just two sites in the ocean to satisfy the needs of 280 million cars. That represents every single car right now that's in the US. And consider this. Only 70 million cars are actually purchased per year. So there is enough minerals here for four years of global car production. And keep in mind, now we have incredible new ways of actually recycling these metals once, they're, once they hit their end of use life in battery packs. For a sustainable future, it is widely accepted that the global population needs to move away from fossil fuels. While electric looks to be a suitably green alternative, as you know, you guys are often hear from me all the time, I repeat this over and over and over, it is the answer to the world's energy needs. To this, It is the solution to reducing warming on the planet. But whilst we can get more metals by mining them, something we've done for thousands of years, we still do need to consider the cost of ripping up forests and displacing wildlife potentially to reach those metals. And some critics say the battery revolution, the clean energy revolution, is not even clean anyway. I mean, look what you're doing. You're damaging the environment, destroying it. Maybe they have a point. Let me know what you think about that. So what if we could access the metals we need to make batteries in some other way? One possible alternative is to move to mining the deep sea. That's where precious nodules, which are called manganese tubers, can be found laying on the seabed as loosely as pebbles on the sand. I mean, barely any actual mining is even needed to get them. These metal-rich nuggets, sometimes referred to as deep sea potatoes, are absolutely fascinating. A mining company called the Metals Company TMC said this, 80% of the world's exploration contracts for nodules are in the clarion Clipperton zone which represents less than half of 1% of the global seafloor. But this represents the largest source of manganese, nickel, and cobalt anywhere on the planet, and that dwarfs everything on land by many, many orders of magnitude. There's enough metals in situ at two of these sites that would satisfy the needs of 280 million cars. This is a quarter of the existing global car fleet, or enough for at least four years of global car production. But keep in mind, many lithium ion batteries don't actually use nickel or cobalt. So it's actually closer to enough for around eight years of electric vehicle production if every single EV in the world, if every single car in the world was fully electrified. At a time when the value of Earth's ecosystem services could outperform carbon credits in the fight for our future. Perhaps it's time to move in a new direction. Mining the deep sea isn't without its environmental and logistical complications. But as a global network of researchers is discovering, taking the plunge is absolutely worth it. And incredibly, it doesn't seem as though these nuggets, which could hold the solution to what we need for the entire planet, or even all that difficult to get to. So how difficult is it to actually get to these nuggets on the seafloor? Well, the mining company TMC said, 
The biggest difference with this project is that it is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's a five day sail from the nearest port on the planet. And the seabed is at 4,000 meters below the surface. That's a long way. That's halfway to the height of Mount. That's halfway to the top of Mount Everest. The depth is a crucial point in the pursuit of these manganese modules. The depth is a crucial point and a big challenge in the pursuit of finding and getting these manganese nodules. The reason is because it's pitted against terrestrial mining sites and there's comparatively very little life in the benthos. TMC told IFL Science there are 13 grams of biomass per square meter on the abyssal sea floor, whereas in the rainforest of Indonesia, one of the leading countries for metal mining, you're looking at closer to 30 kilograms of biomass per square meter. That means the amount of biomass per square meter on the sea floor at 4,000 meters of depth is minuscule in comparison to where we're getting the metals today. This actually would be an incredible solution to the challenges faced by finding these metals. Accessing metals from terrestrial sites means cleaning forests. Accessing these metals from terrestrial sites unfortunately means clearing forests, habitats, and ecosystems, making them vulnerable to erosion that can contribute to runoff, which ends up in the ocean. We know that rainforests are biodiversity hotspots and themselves act as a carbon sequestration tool. So what about the sea floor? Does it perform a similar job? Academics across the globe have been researching life in the benthos to try and better understand this. And some of these academics come from institutions such as London's Natural History Museum, the National Oceanographic Centre in Southampton, Harriet Watt University in Scotland, the University of Leeds, the University of Bremen, the University of Hawaii, Texas, a and and the University of Maryland, among many others. FLSScience.com says that they have discovered that while there is life on and around these nodules on the seafloor, including some larger animals, most of it is microscopic. Some of the earlier press directed at deep sea mining has warned of the risk of mass extinction events, often using imagery of wildlife from shallower water to demonstrate potential victims. But given the already great cost of mining on land, it becomes a balancing act of where the greater harm lies. A lot of people have a misconception of what the seabed looks like at 4,000 meters depth. There is actually life down there. There's no doubt about it, but it's not as abundant as has been portrayed. In fact, it's far less abundant than what most people have been led to believe. Now, of course, just because the life down there is very small doesn't mean it's not important. And that's why TMC have been gathering baseline and collection data at 4,000 meters depth to establish what impact it would have to the base of the sea floor if we were to go down there and collect these manganese nodules. Now, a mining company has already collected over 3,000 tons of nodules from the base of the sea floor. And while they did this, they actually collected data on the effects this had on the seabed. The project eventually aims, though, to collect 1.3 million tons of nodules a year. And the impact of doing this will be assessed and monitored over time by environmental agencies in order to get a clear picture of how deep sea mining will actually realistically influence the environment. Now, companies are saying that in their tests, actually mining for the nodules is causing very little impact to the seabed, but we need to see further details yet before we can actually establish the veracity of these claims. There isn't a perfect solution. There's no getting away from the fact that we don't currently have enough metals in circulation worldwide for recycling to supply enough energy transition metals given the amount we need for the green transition. That's simply the reality we're facing. These source metals need to come from somewhere though. So we're, so we're faced with the dilemma of working out which approach has the best yield to impact ratio. I believe this is it. At present, 60% of the nickel market comes from Indonesia, where rainforest is flattened to make way for operations. This land is used by both humans and wildlife, so its absence is very apparent and its recovery is slow 
due to ongoing use. By comparison, after a collector has scooped up the nodules from the seabed, it can recover very quickly because of, because of the true reality here, and that is that very little is actually going on down there. IFLScience.com says that while these nodules do take millions of years to form, the argument that it's once it's gone, it's gone is true of any source metal. On the other hand, only one option requires the ripping up of carbon sequestering rainforest to reach it. Carbon has been raised as a concern around deep sea mining, as much of it is stored in sediments in the ocean. But TMC explained that at present there's no known mechanism through which that could rise to the surface. A 2020 study actually found that using nodules puts 94% less sequestered carbon at risk and reduces emissions by up to 80% depending on the specific metal you're actually looking for or mining for. Indonesia now makes up more than 50%. Indonesia now makes up more than 50% of the nickel market including the nickel laterite operation at Sulawesi. However, the nodules on the ocean floor also come with the added benefit of a much higher grade, meaning harvesting them has a higher yield, so less time is needed to collect the same volume of source metals compared to a terrestrial operation. If given the go-ahead, the life of TMC's first project, called Nori D, would only continue until 2046, meaning it will last around 25 to 30 years. That will inject enough metals into the global system to enable the circular economy that the world needs. Meaning from that point, we can simply recycle what we already have and continue to use it without needing to mine anymore. Nori D has been estimated by a third party to outperform land-based routes of producing nickel, copper, and cobalt in every impact category analyzed. This is really the solution. And I mean, there is no other alternative that makes anywhere near as much sense as simply picking up these nodules from the base of the sea floor. Now it goes without saying that any endeavor that disrupts an environment should be approached with caution, but at a time when the planet's but at a time right now when the planet is resting on reducing our but at a time right now when the planet needs a very fast reduction in our carbon footprint it's become abundantly clear that collecting nodules from the seafloor at a depth of 4000 meters is far less damaging to the planet than a decades long dig in our few remaining forested areas. Existing mining has a lot of intelligent people working on reducing impact, but they are up against one of the immovable forces on the planet, geology. Mining companies say this, you can't escape the fact that grades of metals are very low and they are falling, which means you can't escape producing ever increasing quantities of waste. We can reduce the carbon footprint of these metals by 90% at a time when combating the climate crisis is most important. In addition, we're not ripping down carbon sinks, like in Indonesia and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. When you rip down the forest, you remove an ecosystem that could have sequestered carbon for hundreds of thousands of years. It's, it's very clear that mining the deep sea is far less damaging to the planet than what we're doing today. This is a solution to the world's energy needs. And it's amazing that we've actually discovered it. And it's very likely now that rather than destroying Indonesia and the Congo, mining companies will simply collect these nodules from the seabed in order to provide all the metals that we need over the next 25 years. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. And thank you for watching.